Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Kishore Kishore, Jaya Kishore Kishore, Kishore Kishore, Jaya Kishore Kishore. Jaya Kishore Kishore, Jaya Kishore Kishore, Kishore Kishore, Jaya Kishore Kishore. Jaya Jagannath. Danger, danger. Yeah, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Shila Prabhu Pada. Gurude, Jaya Jaya Gurude. Jaya on Vishnu Pad, Paramahansa Parivara, Jikacharya. Astotarasatta is divine grace. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahansa Parivara Jikacharya. Astotarasatta is divine grace. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada ki jai. Ananta Koda Vaishnavrinda ki jai. Namacharya Srila Haridas Thakur ki jai. Prem Sikaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhaktivrinda Ki Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Go Gopinath Shai Makund Radha Kund Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Vrindavan Mathur Dham Ki Jai The body when it is hard Ganga Maya Jamuna Maya Bhakti Devi Tulsi Maharani Ki Jai your Lordships, Shri Shri Kishore Kishori Ki Jai. Shri Shri Kishore Kishori Ki Jai. Shri Shri Kishore Kishori Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. Gauda Premanandi.
Giri Bada Dadi First of all, my apology for my voice and also for missing much of yesterday's program because I'm not doing so well. I'm, I'm fine, don't worry about it, but I, like, I was a little wiped out yesterday. And um, some special appreciation from devotees that came from far away Seeing Naikantma leading Mongolarti this morning was like, wow. Of course, Chicago's central. So some people also came from the East Coast. 
like Mitra Shane and other people from the East Coast. So thank you all for coming and taking part in this celebration. Later today, if the schedule follows what it says, we're going to be hearing about the beginning of the worship of Jagannath and Kishore Kishori. I know part of the Kishore Kishori story. I don't really know much about what Jagat Purusha is going to share with us, but I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. I read the little but I'm sure the story is nice. What to speak of what this beginnings of the Hare Krishna movement in Chicago was like, very similar to what we heard yesterday about the beginnings of our book distribution and what austerities the devotees went through just to fulfill the order and wishes of our founder Acharya, fantastic. Those were the days, right? Those of you that weren't with us yesterday, there was a lot of emphasis, a substantial emphasis on the importance of reading Prabhupada's books as well as distributing Prabhupada's books. And I was especially noting and moved by what Mitra Sain shared with us, what he's been doing with his reading group. I don't know how many persons are part of it, but they're that you're giving that association and you're taking them by their hand again and again and again through different readings of Prabhupada's books. It's, it's a nice sharing. So I decided, not based upon that, but I decided that this um, presentation is going to have a few parts. The, the topic is the essence of deity worship. So I thought of doing a few things. Srila Prabhupada said, and then a little bit of some appreciation and um, a couple of video clips, one video clip, one audio clip of Prabhupada speaking about deity worship. And then I thought a nice way to end is something that Kalki did and others, at inviting persons who have done substantial worship specifically for Kishore Kishori and looking at Gopasundri and anyone else that might want to volunteer and share something, so get prepared to be called upon or volunteer to speak something about the meaningfulness of deity worship for them personally. Just uh, in the video clip, it's a morning walk conversation in Melbourne where Prabhupada is saying, essentially, deity worship, the essence of deity worship is following Vaidhi Bhakti to prepare us for spontaneous devotional service. You could say Raga Bhakti through getting the practice according to the Vidhis under the guidance of the spiritual master and so forth to become uh, qualified to approach the deity in his deity form, Krishna in his deity form and become accomplished like an apprentice Will, may become accomplished, Prabhupada gives an example, and then gets a good position because he's now accomplished. So it's, it's practice to come to a, a more complete stage of bhakti, from Vaidhi to Raganuga, Sadhana Bhakti. That's, and in one sense, it's in essence taking that which is within the purview of our senses, in practical, he uses this word often, in practical terms, to prepare ourselves for higher stages of bhakti. That's one way of describing the essence of deity worship. So let's go down the path of Srila Prabhupada's writings. The letters are kind of small. I hope you can read them. Um, are you still connected? Archana is defined nectar devotion. Archana is defined as an offering of articles of worship with mantra after having performed preliminary purificatory activities such as Bhutta, Shuddhi, and Yasas. 
Direct quote, Nectar and Devotion. Here's Prabhupada offering, my guess is the first RT to Krishna Balaram on the occasion of their installation. Same photograph. Deity worship means to fix up your mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. Always worshipping Krishna. A lecture by Srila Prabhupada in Paris, 1974. Something's not working, right? There we go. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 5, describing the nine processes of bhakti. And you see in the nine processes of bhakti is archanam. And in the translation, rather than reading all the translation, it's offering the Lord respectful worship with 16 types of paraphernalia. 16 types of paraphernalia. That's his definition or his translation of Arjuna. So there's details and there's procedures and there's scripture to, to tell us what those procedures and details are, but it's the Archana process. <coughs> then why? What's this purpose of this? In Nectar Devotion, Prabhupada has written, Sri Rupa Goswami has enumerated 64 activities by which a devotee in the beginning stage of devotional service, Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, can engage all his senses in the service of the Lord. And of course, we know what these five are, but one of the five is the last one in this list, serving the deity form of the Lord. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam Association of Devotees, living in Chicago, chanting the holy name of the Lord, serving the deity form of the Lord. So living in Chicago, it's a nice detour. Wherever the deity worship is going on, that's the spiritual world. I remember hearing it distinctly in the Brooklyn Temple and the Manhattan Temple, and I heard a recording of Prabhupada saying the same thing in Los Angeles which was, this temple is not in Brooklyn, it is Vaikuntha. And everyone went, Jai Prabhupada. Same thing in Manhattan, Vaikuntha. Same thing in Los Angeles, Vaikuntha. So living in a sacred place where the deity is worshipped and the activities of Krishna Bhakti are going on with full enthusiasm, That is, living in a sacred place. Practicing these items assures rapid advancement in devotional service, culminating in pure love for Krishna. That's the why. There's another why response from Prabhupada's teachings. It helps us to understand the personality of Krishna who manifests in the deity form. Now these are, these are teachings that we're not unfamiliar with, but I am just, I was thinking in, in reviewing this presentation for this morning, yesterday I was thinking, how many times uh, we've heard these things and Again, in, in, in Mitra Sain's reading groups, how many times you've gone through Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita and this and that. So he, it's not like it's new, but hearing has a purpose. Hearing again has a purpose. Hearing again has a purpose. To think, to contemplate more deeply on the words of our founder, Chai, because just yesterday I was hearing Prabhupada say, when, it, when the, the, the writings and the speakings of our great acharyas is that speaking in the their writing is imbued with the chit shakti potency so hearing again and again is exposing ourselves to the spiritual chit shakti meaning the spiritual potency of krishna 
So no harm. Even we know. But this is the why. It helps us understand Krishna, deity worship, who manifests in the deity form. It helps us to overcome our conditioned nature and become aware of our original constitutional position. The theme is the same. There is a, a nice concluding statement, Canto 7, Chapter 14. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted the Hare Krishna movement with installed deities to spread in, to every village and town in the world so that everyone in the world might take advantage of this movement and become all auspicious in spiritual life. We know, we should know, Prabhupada had a vision that was awaiting to be fulfilled. I remember, for example, here's, there's so many nice examples. One example that profound. Many years ago, there was an inspiration from, I think it was Hansa Duda and Gargamuni, to bring Mercedes buses from Germany overland into India. Malati's nodding her head. You remember that event. And when they started doing that, Prabhupada's remark was, I had this vision long ago. I was just waiting for it to happen. Thank you very much. And as they were traveling around conducting themselves, he authorized them. There was some question, and he authorized that they would have Gornitai deities on their on display for people to receive. Exactly what's being described here, you know, in 7th Canto, chapter 5, chapter 14. Prabhupada had a vision awaiting to be fulfilled. Just a little something sharing related to this, Prabhupada's vision waiting to be fulfilled. Without the background, I, I have, because of visiting China, I developed an interest to learn more about Prabhupada's second book that was, that was printed. The first book was Easy Journey to Other Planets. The second book was Light of the Bhagavad. And in the letter exchange that Prabhupada wrote to the man in Japan who was organizing the, um, I forget, the title of, the, of his event was, what? Yes, culture of the human spirit, cultivation of the human spirit, something like that. Like that could mean anything. Euphemism, it's nice, but what does it mean? So Prabhupada gave definition. And in the letter that he wrote, the letter that he wrote was found later in the trunk along with the manuscript that never got published until 23 years later. But he wrote, he, wanted, he saw his publication work to move the hearts and the minds of educated people that will change the face and direction of the world. I mean, it's very similar to the, the comment that was made Irmala made, I think, that the comment about using printed literature to make Bengal communist. So seeing that, he had that vision awaiting to be fulfilled from way back. He had a vision. And, you know, feeling his enthusiasm for the vision, having full faith in him, again, it was explained, what did we understand about what we were doing? Again, Irmala's point, and I like the points you made yesterday. Uh, we did it. And we sat, you know, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was austere, but austerity is also fun when you're doing something for a higher purpose. So, with installed deities, the Hare Krishna movement, with installed deities, again, Prabhupada, out of his causeless mercy, the Lord is present in his deity form. The Lord appears in his archa vigraha form 
so the conditioned souls can see him and worship him. Even if they don't know what it, what's going on. The spiritual potency is there for all who come before the deity and see the deity. They may think this, they may think that, but the spiritual potency is there in his deity form. By worshiping the archa vigraha, the conditioned souls can engage all their senses in devotional service. Again, the practical, there's the theory, and then there's the practical. He would make this comparison, deity worship is practical. Not that studying Prabhupada's books is not, but it, it brings it to life. Using the senses, Rishikina, Rishikesha, Sevanam. By enthusiastically performing sadhana bhakti and observing that all the regulations of archana, devotees cultivate the understanding that Krishna is directly present in his deity form. So those who have engaged in deity worship in a uh, committed basis, sincere and committed basis, feel, experience some attachment and some relationship and some reciprocation between them and the deity form of the Lord who they are serving. And they, that's, that's the purpose. The essence of deity worship is to come to that stage as Prabhupada well, here it's a nice, short morning walk conversation in Melbourne. But again, the Lord is present in his deity form, quoting Chaitanya Charitamrita Majilila. Oops, what happened? Shraddha Vishveshatak Pritihi Shemur Ter. Wow, what happened? My computer is going bonkers. Oh, there it is again. With love, with love and full faith, one should worship the lotus feet of the deity, Majulila, because he's present in his deity form and he makes himself accessible, even with our blunt senses and and so forth. It's purifying. And he's giving his kindness in those ways. Sometimes people ask, some people claim, chanting of the holy name is the Lord's Yuga Dharma, why perform deity worship? So here's a couple of slides that Prabhupada's addressing that question. Canto 7, chapter 5. Even though the chanting of the holy name is sufficient, to enable one to progress in spiritual life to the standard of love of Godhead, one is nonetheless susceptible to contamination because of possessing a material body. More than susceptible. Consequently, special stress is given to the archana vinti. One should therefore regularly take advantage of both the Bhagavata process and the Panchatrachiki process. Now this is Prabhupada laying out <coughs> his vision and you know, we're going to hear these wonderful stories of how these deities came, but Prabhupada wanted from the very get-go that deity worship along with his books and the chanting of the Holy Name and making sacred places by installing deities so we could reside in sacred places and associate with devotees. That was, that's the Hare Krishna movement. Similar, according to Jiva Goswami, although deity worship is not essential, the material conditioning of most candidates for devotional service requires that they engage in this activity. When we consider their bodily and mental conditions, we find that the character of such candidates is impure and their minds are agitated. Therefore, to rectify this material conditioning, the great sage Narada and others 
have at different times recommended various kinds of regulations for deity worship. So not that we need to be convinced, but the, you know, the, the, the topic I was asked to speak about was the essence of deity worship. So we're relying upon our founder Acharya's teaching. Emphasis he would make again and again in it's not idol worship, but here's some passages. The arch of Igra, the arch of Igraha is an incarnation of the Lord in a form appreciable by a devotee. Therefore, devotees engage in the temple in the service of the Lord as Archa Vigraha, a form made of stola or material objects such as stone, metal, wood, jewels, and paint. And again and again he would say, but it's, that's, the deity is not those five things. There's other three sides. The deity is Krishna himself. Even though the Lord is there in his physical form, he is not different from his original spiritual form. Fourth canto. There is no difference between the potencies of the archa and those of the personal forms of the Lord. Similarly, the archa murti can also deliver the same <coughs> unlimited potency of the Lord as when he was personally present. That's a nice quote, isn't it? If we wish to someday be with Krishna and serve Krishna by serving those dear to Krishna, is it not possible to do that now? From this reference, the same potency is there. One who thinks the deity in the temple to be made of wood or stone is taken to be a resident of hell. We've heard that one before. Padma Purana, Arche Vishnu Shiladir. So here's this nice, it's short, but I hope the sound system works. This is Melbourne Morning Walk Conversation speaking about deity worship. Hari Sori Prabhu asked the question. Therefore, the Vidhi Marga, Vidhi Marga means to walk under the direction of the spiritual master. That's like apprentice in a factory. One is working as an apprentice, he does not know. But gradually, when he becomes practice, then he gets a good job, good salary. Is it not? Similarly, mm. this is apprenticeship. Cries early in the morning, offer mongolarity and bhog, these are so many rules and regulations. Then naturally, there will be a spontaneous love. Mm. In the beginning, there is no spontaneous love. Mm. One has to work under the direction of the spiritual mass and sasana, scriptures. <laughs> Yes, they were, they were saying that this was kind of... Mm -hmm. That was the Vidhi Marga. Vidhi Marga means to walk under the direction of the Spirit of Marga. It's like apprentice in a factory. One is working as apprentice. He does not know. But gradually, when he becomes practice, then he gets a good job, mm. good salary. Is it not? Mm. Similarly, this is apprenticeship. To rise early in the morning, offer mongolarity and bhog, these are so many rules and regulations. Then naturally, there will be a spontaneous love. Mm. In the beginning, there is no spontaneous love. Mm -hmm. One has to work under the direction of the spiritual mass and sasana <laughs> scriptures. Yes, they were, they were saying that this would then a form of idol worship because there was no realization in the service. Uh, even there is no realization. 
it is not idol. It, 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 it is idol worship for the rascal, not for the devotee. The devotee, under the direction of his spiritual master, is engaged in the service of the deity. Uh, the idea is that you cannot approach the Supreme Lord in your present condition. Therefore, He has agreed to take your service just like a stone. You can handle stone, you can handle, but you cannot handle the Virat Rupa, the gigantic form. So it is His mercy. Just like I have given this example many times, it's like a, a small letter box. It is a post office. But for your facility, it is a box. It is post office. Actually, it is post office. You put the letter and it will go. Uh, 10,000 miles, sir. How it goes? It goes. it goes to the GPO and then it was dispatched. That's all right, because it is authorized. Yes. Therefore, the work is being done. Mm -hmm. You don't think I put it in a small box. It has gone to the post office and the work is going on. Mm -hmm. Similarly, for your facility, Krishna has appeared before you as stone, as wood. But he is a stone, he is also Krishna. That requires little brain. He can take service in any form. That is absolute. Because the stone is not defined from Krishna, it is Krishna's energy. So he is able to take service from you in any way. Therefore, you have to approach him authorizedly. That's the, if you imitate a small box in your write simply, uh, the same letter box there, that will not go. That will stay there. Millions of years. But the box which is authorized, that will go. Is it clear? Yeah. And this is It's not, I do not understand. Prabhupada is so strong and succinct. So, nearly completed here. Similar to it's not idle, it's not imaginary, so it's another term taken from Canto 3, Chapter 28. The forms of the Lord are not imaginary, nor manufactured. The Lord's form is depicted in different ways according to scriptures approved and experienced by Acharyas. The Shastrik description of the transcendental form of the Lord is exactly represented in the Archa Vigraha. Non different. Now, if the deity is non different, then why sometimes Krishna looks white and sometimes Krishna looks black and sometimes it's this and that? He can take any form. doesn't detract from the fact that the deity form is Krishna himself making himself Krishna, making himself through the agency of our spiritual founder Acharya, making his darshan and opportunity for direct service for those qualified to touch, dress, bathe, fan, etc. Exactly as goes on in the spiritual world. There, so there, and there's reciprocation. This is what I'd like to hear from our experienced pujaris. This faith and love depends on proper understanding of the deity's identity. My dear Lord, you are not a statue. You are directly the son of Maharaj Nanda. Pratima nahitomi sakshad Virjendra nandana. Now, in the beginning, one may not understand that. 
except accepting the authority, kind of like Hari Sori's question, because we don't have realization, then maybe it's called idol worship because we're just following. But realization will come if there is proper regard. Here's a nice quote from Jaiva Dharma. Same point. The Lord reciprocates according to the degree of one's surrender. So this is the Prakrita Bhakta, or the beginning stage, Madhyama stage, and the Uttama stage. In the Uttama stage, there's realization. In the prior stages, there isn't realization. Always perceiving a deity as Chinmaya, a transcendental and direct manifestation of the Lord. So one may have faith, but not yet realization. It doesn't d diminish the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is the Lord is being very kind in making himself accessible to unqualified, not yet qualified persons, but faithful to Guru and Shastra and following. So gradually from Prakrita, Prabhupada's words, or excuse me, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's words, Jada Maya, or material energy, they see that way. The next, Mano Maya, that he can receive our prayers, etc. And Chin Maya, Bhaktivinoda's way of describing. So here's two slides remaining. Here's the essence of deity worship, which was the topic. A nice reference from the 11th canto. The general principle is that a pure devotee of the Lord understands his relationship with the deity to be eternal. The more one surrenders in loving devotion to the deity, the more one can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Same things as he was saying earlier. Lord Krishna is a person, but he is the supreme person, possessing his own unique feelings. Nice, huh? One can easily please the Lord in devotional service offered to his deity form by pleasing the Lord one can gradually progress in the mission of human life and eventually go back home, back to Godhead, where the deity personally appears before the devotee and welcomes the devotee to his personal abode, known throughout the world as the kingdom of God. Now, this is not Prabhupada's words, it's 11th canto, but it's very nice. The essence of deity worship, much like the message that Prabhupada conveyed in that morning walk in Melbourne. And here's the last slide. You see on the screen um, Prabhupada's words transcribed, and then you can hear his words, because there's a little audio clip. I'll, I'll recite. A devotee, when, with his heart and soul, serves Krishna in dressing him and feeding him, and giving him flower, he becomes smiling. If you can get Krishna once smiling upon you, your life is fulfilled. Bravo. I mean, I, I, I read through some of those things of when the Kishore Kishori worship was beginning and they flew in flowers from Hawaii and decorated the deity very nicely and I'm sure the deity smiled upon whoever made all those arrangements and decorated them, and their life is fulfilled. How kind is our founder, Acharya? Here's Prabhupada's voice speaking this message. Uh, the body, when with his heart and soul, serves Krishna in dressing him, in feeding him, in giving him flower, he becomes uh, smiling, and if he can... Get Krishna one smiling upon you, your life is fulfilled. Thank you very much.
compelling, huh? So uh, the body when sorry, uh, there's there's another nice picture of Kishore Kishore. So. Eight fifteen, eight seventeen. Those who have engaged in worship of Kishore Kishori or in other places, some deity, there. Would if you would like to share some sense, uh, personal things, maybe not, you know, not good to be shared in a an assembly like this. But the the sense of reciprocation with the, the deity form of the Lord. Sometimes the Lord does things and it's the sense of commitment and connection and reciprocation that comes from dedicated deity worship. So I mentioned Gopasundri's name because I always think of her as a dedicated pujari. Would you be willing to share something? Do we have a portable microphone? Um, when I was here, when I was serving here, um, there was few, at a certain point of time, there were very few devotees. So we were able to do all sorts of a variety of deity worship, from cooking to dressing the deities to artiques. Everyone played a role and took all different parts. And what I wanted to share today was about cooking with the Rajbog, because um, what I, I, I love to cook the Rajbog because it was meditation on how to best serve Kishore Kishori, what they might like me to offer. But <clears throat> at the same time that I was um, asked to cook the Rajbog, Yamuni Devi had come out with her cookbook, and I found that each little recipe she had shared a story about her travels with Srila Prabhupada mm. and, put, uh, and told about Srila Prabhupada's reaction to the food, uh, stories about food that Pishma served to him or that he ate at different festivals or at, that he ate as a child. And so I would meditate not only on serving Kishore Shori, but on what Srila Prabhupada's the story and the leela and the food that he would like to eat. And I felt that that service, like it brought me closer to Srila Prabhupada and to Kishore Kishore. And, and one other story for the Chicago devotees who were here at that time, who might remember Bhuvaneshwar Prabhu. Um, he cooked a wonderful eggplant, tomato and potato sabji. And who? I- Who? Bhubaneshwar Prabhu. Oh, Bhubaneshwar. And I asked him one day, I said, Bhubaneshwar Prabhu, could you please teach me this recipe? He was, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> and, he, and he walked away from me. And then uh, about six months later, I said, Bhubaneshwar Prabhu, please, can you teach me this recipe? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And then like another six months later, I said, Hare Krishna Bhuvaneshwar Prabhu, can you teach me this recipe? And he was like, Gopasundri, come into the kitchen. And, um, and, and I felt just like that last slide you showed, Maharaj, um, that um, if I got Bhuvaneshwar, if I please Bhuvaneshwar Prabhu with this subject, if I learn this subject, and he smiles on me, that I would be fulfilled as a, as a Rajpo cook. And I think I um, got his approval on that one. So it was really sweet. Did you practice his recipe? And it came out like Bhubaneshwar's? Almost, not uh, quite as good as Bhubaneshwar's. But you practiced at it and I'm sure it got better. Yeah. That's, thank you for sharing it. Bhubaneshwar is an interesting personality. Seeki, you were gesturing. You wanna say something or you're pointing to someone? Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Something about Kishore Kishori and 
and some others because I I got my Brahmin in Mayapur in February seventy seven. So during that I began worshiping the deities immediately when I came back. Um, little Radha Krishna and Jagannath mostly. Occasionally, you get to dress Kishore and Kishore. But my memories mostly of this reciprocation is even those who are not going on the altar. Uh, at that time, of course, there's so much Lakshmi coming in from the book distribution that. Um, uh, Especially with Shiva Ramaraj when he was temple president. They would fly flowers from Hawaii to Chicago. I don't did they do that in New York also in other temples? I heard it, I didn't I thought it was you that mentioned it. Yeah, at least in Chicago we did. We had regular shipments of flowers from Hawaii. And uh, the, the uh, two Pajari, Satbuj. And I uh, can't remember his name. And with a P from Detroit. But Patrikan, Patrikananda, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The transcendental competition between the two of them. Because, you know, when you dress the deities, of course, you know, you want to flare the outfits and so many things. And Patik Chandra, yeah. Very expert. So even though the devotees are really, you know, they're concentrating on book distribution and all these things, but the deity greeting, that, that, that gave you an excitement to keep you awake during your job. <laughs> and she could not wait until the deity curtain was going to open, especially when those two would dress. So because something or extraordinary would always happen, which seemed like impossible. How can you, how many different ways can you put the outfit, move it, put the dress, and things like that? So, but as the service is going on, we're chanting our job in the job room, and, uh, you know, you're anticipating, oh, it's coming soon, you know, it's going to be really nice, I can't wait. And then, of course, you know, with the perfection of the George Harrison's Govinda songs with the Didi greeting is... is it's perfect. What else can you do? Even if you just, even if we just had, you think sometimes, let's replace it with Kirtan. No, no, you have to have that song playing. Is it? So the curtains open and everyone is just in ecstasy. And you look over and maybe you see Satbu kind of looking a little jealous way. <laughs> so you know, tomorrow she's going to dress. <laughs> so more excitement is being generated amongst all the devotees. Oh man, I can't wait till tomorrow. Because each time they would outdo each other. Every time they would dress. So even amongst those who were not going to altar, that, that kind of reciprocation with the service that the Pajaris were doing was greatly felt. And uh, personally, I mean, being such a new devotee, you're not going to get those kind of reciprocations in the beginning. But years later, especially, um, I would say one when I went to New Vrindavan to do the service there. So very challenging. Sometimes, you know, you can't find people to do the service, so temple president has to do it, right? <laughs> and uh, I've always engaged in the kitchen by cutting vegetables and washing. But I used to meditate. It would be so nice to be able to cook for the deities one day. Imagine cooking Raj Bog, all these things. One of these days, I'm going to be able to do that. So I don't know why I was thinking that, but all of a sudden in New Vrindavan, where's the person cooking Raj Bhog? <laughs> they didn't show up. And I didn't have time to find them. I was like, what am I? Oh, I said, I don't want the offering to be late because basically Temple President is, he's like the chief butler. Everything has to be on time for the deities. Everything has to be clean for the deities. That's how you think as Temple President, really. And everything is supporting that. So uh, Shanka, this will happen to be there. I said, Shanka, I know you're busy, but you're going to have to cook Raj Bhog. He flat out refused. Not going to happen. I'm not my problem. I said, give me your cookbook. I've never cooked before. <laughs> yeah, it's cooked. 
I said, you're going to pick some recipes that I can cook and make this Raj Bogey. And uh, I was thinking when it happened, I said, I guess the deities, they're fulfilling my desire to let me cook Raj Bog for them, even though I'm not qualified. So anyway, I cooked Raj Bog. First time cooking from the cookbook and cooked Raj Bog. Only one item didn't come out well because I'm trying to follow his recipe with his help. But he didn't write that recipe very well because when you got to the end, it says, cook till done. <laughs> like, what does that mean? He said, I got tired. I just left it like that. I said, but I don't know what that, you have to come in here and check. I don't have time. I'm like, oh, man. So I had to let that one just kind of go. But uh, then afterwards, you eat it, it was like, it was okay. It wasn't like, you know, something to die for, nor did it kill you. <laughs> but, yeah, I got to cook rice well. And, and one more time, too, I visited uh, Washington, D.C. for Rathiatra. Back in the days when Hartley Nee was really coming and I'm, I remember, you know, they have Sita Ram. I said, I've dressed all kinds of deities, you know, New Vrindavan they have, Nataraj, so many different forms. I said, you know, I've never dressed Sita Ram before. All of a sudden, after Mangalarti, I'm the only one there, the Pajari comes out. You're a Pajari, aren't you? Come in there and help me. You dress Sita Ram. <laughs> I go, okay. Because <laughs> everyone was busy getting ready for, it was Rath Yatra Day. Anyways, if, if you know, in the early days when they purchased deities, they purchased them with the clothing carved on them, you know, crowns and chudders. Not like nowadays, they're just a form with, you know, some simple coverings. So Sita Ram, you can't figure out the outfits. It's like there's so many ways you have to cut it to make it fit. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how to... And if one Pajari is dressing all the other deities. He's like, no, you just do Sita Ram, and I can do all the rest. So I don't know which off is Hanuman's, which one is Ram's, which one is Sita's, which one. I'm struggling up there. I'm like, man, okay, let me pick the jewelry out at least. Okay, I'm still, finally, he had to help me. But anyway, they reciprocated and allowed me to dress Sita Ram also. So a lot of the reciprocation I see is in service, or usually, you know, you want to serve, and they give you more opportunities for that, you know, at least, at least on the levels of it. So, Shri Kishore Kishore Ki, Aravindama Chandra Ki, Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman Ki. Yeah, I, I, th th before, you, before you pass the microphone, let's go to the lady's side. Irmala raised her hand, but before Irmala speaks, Make your best effort to address the, the point of the kind of reciprocation. And, and this is my my personal interest. The reciprocation, not the, necessarily the stories related to deity worship, but the reciprocation that one feels between the worshiper and the deity in course of time, that, that something but like that you, happens. You want it focused on Kishore Kishori. No. Kishore Kishori for sure. I mean, I could tell other stories, but I'd, I'd like to focus on Kishore Kishori. So Great, thank you. In, in one sense, one could say I joined the Hare Krishna movement because I read Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and I heard Prabhupada chanting, but actually it's Kishore Kishori who brought me to the Hare Krishna movement. Absolutely. Wow. So I have to tell a little story or there's no foundation. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Go, that, that personal so I had, uh, I'd first visited, my first contact with Krishna consciousness was in 67 in New York, where I heard a recording of Prabhupada chanting, and 69 I visited the temple in New York. Uh, but I got Prashila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita in the end of 1972. And when I came here to Chicago to do a two-month uh, work pro program as part of my college study at the Museum of Science and Industry, I ended up, uh, I was looking for the temple, but in the Radha Krishna Temple album, it was listed as North Halstead. And so in those days, you had to call information to get a number. And you, I thought it was in Chicago. And when I called Chicago information, they said, well, there's a Mr. Radha Krishna, <laughs> who when I called, he invited me to his house. But I, I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find the temple. And after six weeks in Chicago, looking everywhere for the temple and chanting, the Isha Upanishad, while I was working at the Museum of Science and Industry, I ran into Yasumari Nandana on the L. 
I was, at, I was staying with a friend at Northwestern. So I came for the last two weeks without my parents knowing, and I stayed in the Evanston Temple. Now, at that time, there was just the little Radhakrishna deities and the Jagannath deities. Now, I had been raised in a, a very religious Jewish family. I had received extensive Jewish education, and we were trained heavily in impersonalism, like really, really heavily, that if you worship a form of the Lord, you're going to hell. If you imagine a form of the Lord, you're going to hell. It was like the worst possible spiritual offense would be to worship a form of the Lord. So when I stayed those two weeks, I did not see the deities. I didn't notice them. I mean, you see Radha Krishna, you see how small they are. And Jagannath, I mean, who would ever think that someone's worship? I'm sorry. So I just didn't see them. I saw the arti. I mean, I went to one Mongol arti, and I said, this is what I want to do. That's it. I want to wake up every morning and have a party, and that was it. <laughs> and I love the philosophy. Anyway, so I, I was only 17, and my parents had paid for the rest of the year of college. So I went back to college. As soon as I went home, I said, I'm vegetarian. I want to be Hare Krishna. I'm going to drop out of school at the end of the year. And at college, I started wearing a sari. I mean, it was just a piece of fabric that was too short in every way, and I looked ridiculous. But anyway, and uh, I tried to cook prasadam for my whole dorm, visited the Boston Temple during that time, and I was wearing tilak and sari all the time. And so the semester was over, dropped out of school, went home. So that, I got home on a Thursday in June. And at home, I didn't feel comfortable wearing a sari. I put my blue jeans back on, and... My mother starts saying, you sure you want to do this? And my friends are saying, you sure you want to do this? Maybe you should travel over the summer, do this. And my mind started wavering. So then it was Saturday, June 16th. We were sitting for our Sabbath meal. And I got the mail, and there was an invitation. Sunday, June 17th, I think it was 3 p.m., come for the installation of Kishore Kishore. I don't know, installation of Kishore Kishore. I had no idea what that meant. It was some kind of a something. And Krishna in my heart said, you have to come right now. Don't wait. And I looked at my parents at the, at the lunch table and I said, tomorrow, I'm going tomorrow to Chicago. That's it. I'm doing this. I'm not doing anything else. My father said, okay, I'll give you a round trip ticket. I ended up cashing in the return fare to buy a sleeping bag. So, you know, I came and I expected to be picked up at the airport. <laughs> yeah, I told them I was coming. <laughs> anyway, I got there around noon, and no one's there, of course. And I called the temple, and they were like, we're having a festival. Take a bus. So anyway, I walked in the, the door and uh, about noon, and Kishore Kishore were installed about, I think, about 3 in the afternoon. And uh, well, then I couldn't miss that there were deities. Like, I couldn't not see that there were deities. That wasn't possible anymore. And we were immediately engaged um, in taking, in serving. I mean, I was brand new, but we were immediately engaged in doing deity worship. As I said before, Monday I was on Harinam and Tuesday I was at O'Hare, but we also had to do deity worship every morning. We had to wash the Kishore Kishore's plates and polish their brass and silver. There was no sinks. We had to bring tubs into the Pujari room. And I was making garlands. First time I made a garland, I made it asymmetrical, and I got yelled at, and they told me I had to make it symmetrically. And I said, you know, I like to do freeform things. <laughs> they said, no, you can't do it that way. And the first two weeks, I was in, in crisis. I was in absolute crisis, like, what am I doing worshiping an idol? I was completely freaked out. I had dropped out of school. I had gone from the East Coast to come to Chicago. I told everybody I'd made this commitment, and here I was worshiping idols, and I was, I, I was really, really freaked out about it. I didn't know what to do. Mm. I'm like, I'm violating everything I've ever taught mm. about spirituality and religion and God, and what did I get myself into? So the one thing I mentioned with book distribution is I was out at O'Hare every day, and I was able as somebody just in the movement for a couple days to philosophically defeat anybody I met in the airport. So that gave me a lot of faith in the philosophy. But I was serving Kishore Kishore every single day. 
I was washing their plates. Every day I was polishing their breasts and silver. Usually I do that before I went to the airport. I was making their garlands. And after two weeks, I looked at Kishore Kishore, and they were not stone statues. They were not? Stone statues. Uh. They were there. And I went, oh. These are not idols. So you weren't in violation of what you learned? I didn't care anymore. But you weren't in violation of what you learned? I wasn't. No. You're, you're not worshiping idols? I wasn't worshiping idols. It was an incredible, incredible experience. That they just, they, I was doing a little service, and the service I was doing was, was in, in doubt and in irritation. Why am I doing this? And they're like, they were just, thank you very much. Here we are. You know, and, and by the end of the two weeks, I remember during those first two weeks, I was talking to Kalalapa, and I said, well, you know, maybe I'll stay for the summer. And she's like, you're not going to stay to get initiated? And I was like, <laughs> what did I do? And at the end of that two weeks, it just they just opened everything up for me, that here I am, this is, this is the person. And so Existential I, crisis is ecstatic. It was, it was so ecstatic. I had mine. Mine is different than yours. It but. was so ecstatic. I mean, I have other, other wonderful uh, things with, with Radha Govinda in New York, and then I worship Giri Raj and, uh, and Shaligram. So I have other. But I thought I'd really try to focus on Kishore Kishore, to whom I owe everything. And I really, I really would like to think to thank Leela Manjari and Namruchi because... By the time I knew that there was a festival, I was already committed to a European tour. And I was already, you know, they contacted me and I say, I'm sorry, I'm going to be in Europe. And it would mean I'd have to, and I'm with my grandson, and I said it would mean somebody would have to fly me from Europe to Chicago and back to Europe. Because I've already made commitments throughout Europe, and they're like, forget it. And so then, it, like a few weeks later, it was still my email, and, and I, I just said, you know, is there any chance? And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll fly you. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot express how, how much it means to me, I'm sorry, that I can be here today. <laughs> sorry. But, you know... We've been through a lot in the Hare Krishna movement. I've personally been through a lot in the Hare Krishna movement. There's been all kinds of crises and all kinds of difficulties, and they don't seem to stop. <laughs> you don't get to a point where they're over, <laughs> where there's no more something. And if people ask me, why have you stayed? The reason I've stayed is, is, is that they're, they're the reason I've stayed, ultimately. That, that Srila Prabhupada's books and the loving reciprocation of Kishore Kishore. Beautiful. So, thank you. Thank you. So on the men's side, then Leela Mandri, you're next, okay? Please, something. Go ahead, on the men's side. Uh, hard ball, everybody. I'm Mark and Dea. I was here with Kolke in 81. 81. And the temple room used to be upstairs. And there was a stage going that way. And we used to do plays here. And um, then we moved the deities down here. And I just wanted to point out the Shringa song. So, Jagat Guru Swami and Kolki, if I'm not mistaken, designed this thing. And it was made in a tiny little shop in Vrindavan, in Bombay. I mean, that could never fit in the shop that was made in. I mean, it was one of those little stalls. Yeah. And periodically, every few months, Govindadat was here. 
Mitrasane, were you here? We would get these Polaroid pictures of these guys with hammers and chisels in this little shop, <laughs> sculpting that piece by piece in all these pieces. And one day, I don't know, it took like a year or something, a truck shows up with all of these like hundreds of pieces wrapped up with letters and numbers and a diagram of how to put it together, like an actual drawing, like in, in pen, like on the back of a sales receipt, some Indian shop, you know? And there's these pegs that come out of each piece, and one by one you put it together and the pieces just all fit together. We were up there with ladders and like, you know, like how do you get to the very top there? <laughs> <laughs> and it took about, I think, a couple of weeks to put the, uh, the we call it an altar. The Shringasan is like the beauty seat to frame the... Uh, the deity. So I, I was doing book distribution, and my wife at the time, Ananda Chinmayi, she would sew for the deities. And um, she was living here, I was living in St. Louis, and Tamal Krishna arranged our marriage. And my second son from that marriage is right there, his name is Sean. And he has, he has an older brother named Naveen, and then later I had twins, and I named the son Kishore. And, but he calls himself Kishore, not Kishore. But about once a week, I would get to uh, dress the deities. And I have to tell you, it was a, the real highlight of my week. Because as a book distributor, you know, we would go to Mangalarti, chant our rounds, take prasadam, and, and deal with that crazy world. <laughs> and the, you know, what Prabhupada said, you know, as a neophyte devotee, even you can feel it is, you know, humbled. You don't feel that the deity is stone. You really feel like you're, I felt like the most fortunate person in the world, like I'm actually here and God is letting me serve him. This is incredible. Fantastic. You know, and we, we take it kind of for granted that, we call it taking darshan because really like the act of seeing, we think of it as we're looking out into the world. But that's not really what's happening if you think about it. You know, there's light, there's objects out there. Light is hitting those objects, those, these photons are bouncing off of those objects and hitting your eye and stimulating these nerve cells in your eye that create an image in your head. And if for those who wear glasses, I now wear contacts. We're not seeing through the contacts or the glasses. The light gets changed when it hits the lens and then hits your eye. So really we're not seeing the deity. You can't see the deity with material eyes. You can't see Krishna. He's seeing us, right? We're putting ourselves in his presence to be seen. And you really get that sense when you dress the deity and do puja. Just wanted to say that. Wonderful stories. Thanks. Um. She's a shy one. It's really hard for her to speak, but she's going to do it anyways. Something. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I'm shy, but... Once you, um, once you get started, you'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just afraid I'll cry. <laughs> oh. 
The whole idea of the reunion and the celebration of Kishor Kishori's um, 50th anniversary came from you. Um, and uh, you sent me. I was just channeling Irmila. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You sent me a little note that um, Radha Govind are celebrating the 50th anniversary, so you should do something similar for Kishore Kishore. Um, so, and then uh, Premara said one day she dressed Kishore Kishore and she came into the Pujari room and she said, We have to celebrate Kishore Kishore's 50th anniversary. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And we weren't sure if it was 72 or 73 because we, we never took the time to investigate so much about the history of the temple. So, um, so me and Sunil Madhav Prabhu, Primarasa and Gajendra Moksha Prabhu, we were in the Pujari room and we were like, yeah, yeah, we have to celebrate, like, you know. And then she said, we need to have a reunion of devotees. And... Um, so at that time, like we started feeling like reunion means like only Nityananda Pran Prabhu. That was our reunion. <laughs> so we were thinking he would come and Prithu Shava Prabhu and Danakeli and Akundita and Vaninath. And um, that's all we could think about because we didn't know anybody who served at the temple. So, um, so we waited. And like six months, like we want, we started advertising about the festival, but no one came, and there was no money. We somehow like were hoping that someone will do the festival, so we were saying, "Why don't you do it? You take the lead. We'll be behind you. You take the lead. We'll be behind you." And no one was coming forward, so we thought, "Okay, like then we have to do it if no one is coming forward." So we. We took permission, and then um, in um, April, May, actually, I went to um, New Vrindavan, and Jai Krishna Prabhu was sitting with me, and he said, so Mataji, you are planning the reunion. What's your budget? I said, $60,000. And he said, how much did you get? Uh, I said, like, not so much. We didn't have, like, even a penny by May. But then we kept like advertising it, and there was like no response until like Urmila Mataji was the only first person who said, I, I joined Kishore Kishori's temple, like last, like on the day they were installed. So there was only one person who responded until recently, like a month ago. So we were thinking like nobody would come and like there is no money and there is like no support, like not much. So... But all we knew was like, we just had to keep going. We couldn't wait for anything. And then we met Urmila Mataji and Danikali Mataji introduced me to Gora. Is he here? Gora Prabhu. So he started like sending out invitations on Facebook and he had the contact information of 930 proper disciples. So... But then, like, it was, like, is Suresh Bodhiwala here? He said, like, and then, like, re after she came, everybody started showing some interest. <laughs> so she was the only one, like, who responded. And, and then, like, you know, but Suresh Bodhiwala, he said, you cannot worry like this. If you don't have money, money will come. Don't worry. <laughs> you cannot keep worrying like this. <laughs> so, so... I'm the face of the event, but there are like several, several devotees who just came forward. Like, you know, I just have to stand in the temple and someone will say, Mataji, here, take $1,000. I'll give you $1,000. Just do this festival. And it has been an incredible response from the community and from the devotees. And I'm just the face, but behind me, like there are many, many devotees who have spent like, not slept properly in weeks 
just to go like bring some funds or like you know bring flowers for the deities or to like book tickets for the devotees and so yeah, i'm i'm praying that all the in front of kishore kishore i'm standing here the mercy of all the devotees flows to all of them who have been behind this festival especially like i'm chintamani suresh bodiwal gajendra moksha prabhu sunil madhav prabhu premarasa and my husband of course because i wouldn't cook he if he ate he ate if he didn't eat he didn't eat thank you maraj we have just a few minutes left <coughs> anyone else in the room that would like to share something before we end You are okay. Oh, Kishore, Kishore, how are you all? This is a deity story. Can you hear me? Not so well. Hold it okay. closer. That's this, good. This is a deity story. I I've got quite a few experiences with the deities that are exceptional. but it's Krishna's mercy uh i got some uh radha govinda deities four inch deities back in the 80s from vishabadas and i was working at the university of illinois and i had a studio apartment with one bedroom a living room and a kitchen and i was living upstairs over this tire shop it was three apartments there one was my sister had one one of my nieces had one and i had one and this happened on a good friday i never will forget it uh i had a uh, radha govinda and it was in the middle of the night i was asleep I, and i heard a knock on the door i w- woke up to answer it and it was one of my friends who was a baptist minister i let him in and i was i was wondering you know why are you visiting this late and so we as he walked into the apartment into the kitchen there was a refrigerator right by the door as you walk in and all of a sudden this guy goes up in the air comes down by the refrigerator on top of his head comes into the middle of the floor and starts to spinning around he knocks the table over and everything off the refrigerator and off the table Yeah, I didn't know what life. was going on. I didn't know what to think. I was I was stunned. But all I, what I did think initially was everybody's going to think you beat him up. You know, you might go to jail. So I went immediately to the deities and I offered incense and I asked that whatever was going on, don't let him die, you know. And so the next morning my sister as came down and asked me what was going on did me and Lewis get in a fight i said no we weren't fighting i said but he got beat up pretty badly and uh she related the story to me that i i i didn't know until she told me she said that Lewis had been going around up and down the 8 18th street i was living in in the latino neighborhood and uh, and uh every easter they do the re- reenact the stations of the cross with Jesus Christ and and in the park they have Golgotha set up and it's a big community event so my sister told me that Lewis had been walking up and down the street in some purple robes and a gold belt gold sash and he was disparaging the deities that i had 
And I told her what had happened. And she said, well, you sure you didn't beat him up? I said, no, I didn't beat him up. And I realized that that was the reason that he got beat up, because he had spoke badly against the deities in the neighborhood. And all the people in the neighborhood, they liked me, you know, so it was, it, it proved to me that the deities are alive. It proved to me that the deities take care of me. They take care of us. We take care of them. It proved to me that the deities love us if we love them. So I, I've got a bunch of stories like that where the deities just do extraordinary things. Hare Krishna. Kishore, Kishore, Kijai. I think we should end because we have a nice schedule breakfast next. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Jagat Purusha's explanation of the deities coming in those early days and Malati's nice explanation of the Kishore Kishori manifesting. You, you, <clears throat> you've got the icing on top of the cake for this evening. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful story, filled with op obstacles and mercy and everything else. So let's end. Shiva Prabhupada ki, Shri Shri Kishore Kishori ki, Gornitai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra ki, Jai.